Um, okay, so we wanted to um, discuss a little bit of a touchy subject, possibly, but uh, regarding the um, phenomenon today um, in the Das Torah world specifically, regarding the rejection of metaphoric readings of certain parts in the Torah. Um, classical Roshonim, Rambam, Radak, Ralbag, Sforno, Sforno even Kaspi, they've all, if in, in some, in different forms, have allegorized certain parts specifically regarding the Genesis narratives. Um, you also see it uh, regarding Eov, different, different uh, books in Tanakh. What is your... Um, what is your view of uh, this phenomenon of rejecting uh, what was at the time of the Rishon, not something that, you know, it was, the discussion was there at that time. Today, it feels like the discussion is not able to be had as much. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that's a healthy thing? Uh, wh where do we go with that? Well, um, you're 100% correct that uh, the Vishayinim in many, many ways were much more broader-minded uh, in their understanding of the Torah than we are today. Uh, in some ways, there's been a backlash of, of reaction. Uh, part of it is that we do live in a world of, of fear, and some of the fears are legitimate. The old slippery slope paradigm in which, oh, once you make something, once you make uh, the Garden of Eden metaphorical, you're going to make Tefillin metaphorical, and you're going to make Pesach metaphorical. And there's really this fear that you might undermine the whole halachic structure of the Torah, which is really the great, great fear. And I'm not going to say that those fears are unjustified. However, there's always a weakness with the slippery slope, because uh, just because your extreme is not going to be right doesn't mean that the incremental movements are incorrect. So in many, many ways, as I say, uh, the response to all sorts of things, and I think you're going to ask about science and Chazal as well, uh, is all of, all of this fear about how far is this going to go. But if you're asking me on the, on the actual subject matter itself, I do think there are parts of the Torah that legitimately can be uh, explained in metaphorical, allegorical ways. Uh, there was such a mahalach in Mishonim. There's even a mahalach like this in Kabbalistic literature. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a term, and I, I may get in trouble with this, but uh, hopefully the people that would criticize me won't be listening. Uh, there was a great scholar of mythology, uh, Joseph Campbell, a secular scholar, you know, who analyzed all sorts of myths. And he made a very important point. Now, when we say something is a myth, so normally that means, oh, it's a lie, it's a foolishness. He said, that's not at all the case. Myth is one of the most powerful ways to communicate the deepest spiritual truths of a society, through mushal, through metaphor, through allegory. And indeed, although some people don't even like this for Chazal, but indeed, if you look at Maral and you look at uh, the Bill Ligon even, you will find that their approach in the Midrash of Chazal was always to understand that Midrashim were not always meant to be taken literally. So people ask the dichotomy, is Midrash true or is it false? That's a false dichotomy. It's not a question of true or false. It's certainly true. The question is, is truth to be literal or can truth be symbolic and allegorical? The fact that it's symbolic and allegorical does not make it less true. Rather, it refers to a profound truth that is communicated in a particular medium. I believe, and again, although people will argue even on that, but I believe that in Medrash and Agadita, this is a very well-established Mahalesh, even though, as I say, some will disagree with that as well. So the question becomes, okay, uh, can this be a methodology that's legitimately applied to the Torah itself? I think that we've shown him say, in, in, at least in some, in some instances, some instances, it is. But as I say, it's, a, it's like atomic energy, nuclear energy. You know, it's kind of a dangerous demon to open up because it could destroy all sorts of things. And that's why you have to use it with caution. But certainly, once you're de I mean, I've seen, for example, modern Orthodox people speculate that the Avos might be mythological figures 
you know, I, I would not be comfortable. I'm not comfortable with that. I think uh, there is a historicity of Am Yisrael that we cannot deny. I mean, on one hand, you see it, you see at Mitzrayim has metaphorical meanings of slavery, freedom, and the like, but but it also is historically based. On the other hand, when you're dealing with pre mobile issues, Briata Olam, I, I do think that there's almost a line that you can draw between Parshat Rashid and, and then Parshat Noah, or at least Parshat Lechlucha, you know, in which the Briata Olam is such a mystery that I think there is more latitude for a certain allegorical interpretation you might have in the rest of the Torah. You know, it's because when I always, while I grew up, I always, it, it almost seemed to me that the Torah was the the method of telling over the whole Garden of Eden story and all of the creation narratives. It's almost like it's so different, just, it, just the, the style, right? It's so different from, you know, Bereshit into the, other parts of the Torah, that it's almost like when you originally said, when the rabbi originally said, you know, um, if we if we allegorize, let's say, you know, uh, Gan Eden or creation narratives, and you know, where is it going to end? What I wanted to say when you said that was, but like, but if you look at it in itself, it's so different from the rest of the Torah, stylistically, everything about it. It's almost like it's screaming at you. You know what I mean? Like, it's so exaggerated. You know. Talking, like, snake in the garden. talking snakes. So I never felt that that would really lead for me to go into start to like, you know, doubt Picking Abraham apart, yeah. or Yitzhak Yaakov. Those stories are not told in the same vein. You know, I, I agree with you. I mean, my overall sense is that many, many Rishonim felt that Maseh Bereshis was a, including the early events of other Bechava, were just qualitatively different types, type of narrative. Right. Uh, and I will tell you that um, at least one very prominent, well, not prominent, but a great, great, great uh, thinker in Talmud Chacham, who perhaps is not as well known as he should have been, Rabbi Gedalia Nagel, Zichron of Racha, who was a Talmud of the Chazenish. He was well established in the Litvish Torah world. Uh, he was Nanami Yegiya Kapav. He never became a Rosh Hashiva. He worked as a contractor, but he was phenomenal. Talmud Chacham. And uh, Rav Shilat uh, wrote some transcripts of some shiurim. Maybe maybe you came across the book Mitzvah yeah, Rashi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah, yeah, writing yeah. them up. And, yeah. uh, this is a phenomenal book because you know uh, when when Nadim Slifkin says those ideas, they can they can dismiss them and throw them off, throw them under the bus. Uh, when Rav uh, Nadal says it, you know you can't uh, you can't say anything about him. You know, so so it is interesting that I think you know he's moved in that direction. He moved in that direction with Doshi Yeah, and I, I also think there's such a value today to, in not like, like there's a line in the sand that the Das Torah world kind of draws that it's a shame because there are so many people who would benefit. People I talk to also, and I've explained to people that, you know, the Rambam's um, understanding of of visions, right? Where, where um, whenever there's an angel mentioned in a story, they're having a vision. So that changes a lot of stories. Like, the narrative of Bilam and the talking donkey. Now the donkey is now part of a vision, you know, and that actually, that sits well with people, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I just wanted to add to what he said. I think I think part of what he's saying is that the, the method of, you know, bringing someone up and kind of shielding him from any, any of this type of thought might work in a vacuum but when you're taking someone who's just coming from a regular, you know, normal, you know, uh, experience growing up, the idea that everything is literal is going to be counterproductive to him. It seems almost like the, the Das Torah world is just focusing on the people within their vacuum and not really looking at what that's doing towards extending to the rest of, you know, Jewish uh, denominations that might not, might not be brought up with it. You get what I'm saying? No, no, 100%. I mean, this is the problem. I, I, I think even strategically or tactically, uh, there's a mistake being made here because the theory is, the theory of a lot of the Das Torah is we can't allow uh, articulation of these ideas because it will take people away from pure emuna in the Torah. Mm -hmm. The problem is by insisting on a certain literal perspective, 
you're going to be driving people away. So There's instead an of alienation saying, that's yes. by default happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. And not only are you going to drive people away who are not already affiliated with you, but you're going to have even thinking people within the Haredi Torah world itself. Correct. If, if they're presented a certain static model that has to be exactly this particular way, and then they come to the conclusion that that's not a plausible reading, you've given them no alternative to remain within the faith. And that's absolutely catastrophic. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I have seen more and more now a phenomenon that I call uh, the mere the mere apicor mere means M I R apicoris. I mean, yeah, I, don't, I don't mean to be smirch mere in particular, but I'm coming across now yeshiva educated people who are in kollel and they have children with sitiza, and they just decide over a course of time they don't believe things anymore. It's hard to fault them. It's an absolute tragedy. It's a tragedy, Mamish. And uh, all uh, and Kirov cannot reach these people because they've heard they've heard every Kirov argument already. You know, well, what are you going what are you gonna tell them? But my very amateur diagnosis in part is that they were presented a certain model of Torah, and with the and the Yiddish guy rises or falls on that model. When that model no longer works for them. They have no alternative other than rejection of Yiddishkeit Magamra. If they would understand a greater range of interpretive possibilities, I believe that they could have stayed in the fold. I mean, I, I try to do that now, uh, try to bring them back, but it's very, very difficult because they literally were taught what Torah Shabal is, and that's what it is. Everything was given to Moshe. Every word of the Gemara was given to Moshe, whatever, whatever it would be. And given that rigidity, they feel they have nowhere to go, yeah. but out. So in a sense, the, the, the fear of the slippery slope uh, can actually work in the opposite direction. Well said. So well Beautiful. said.